to make sure. Well, good evening, and uh, as Troy said, my name is Josh Duclo. I host a talk radio show. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? I host a talk radio show on WHBY, which is AM 1150 and FM 1035 here in the Valley. Uh, I've been doing that since May of 2016, when uh, immediately following my attempt to become governor, uh, not governor, mayor, give me time, to become mayor of Appleton. Uh, did not succeed in that endeavor, but it led me down the path of talk radio, and I've been loving it. Uh, to my right, we've got our panelists for this evening's discussion, and to the far right is Representative Gordon Hintz from the Oshkosh area. He was actually my guest host of Fresh Take on Monday, so that was fun. Uh, gave me a chance to get out and uh, visit my sister down in the Chicagoland area, and uh, Gordon, welcome, and thanks for coming here today. I mean, you may want to pull that out of the stand and just yeah. hold on to it. Yeah, see how that works. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Is it on? Yeah, we got All you. Right. Excellent. Thanks for having me. Between Gordon and I is Amanda Stuck. She is the state representative for basically uh, Menasha Central Appleton area. And uh, is it two terms now you've been in the assembly, Amanda? Yeah, this is my second term. Second term. All right. Well, thanks for being here tonight. So, um, obviously, we're here to talk Foxconn. Uh, I tell you, there's been very little else to be talked about as far as state politics go. Since we don't have a state budget, uh, you know, this seems like a good thing to be talking about. And uh, I wanted to start out by setting the stage a little bit. And Troy mentioned one of the items that I want to bring out, which is there are no Republicans, elected or otherwise, on this panel tonight. And uh, it's interesting to me because the vote we had in the assembly was a bipartisan vote. There were Democrats and Republicans on both sides of that vote, as lopsided as it looked. There were actually a few Democrats that voted in the assembly. Right, Amanda? Yeah. With the Republicans in favor, uh, they were mostly in districts near the location of where this factory has been proposed, and there were a couple of Republicans who voted against it with the rest of the Democrats. So um, it wasn't necessarily a partisan vote. I guess I would describe it as a regional vote on the periphery with mostly partisan identification holding tight there. Um, but since it has been announced in a much ballyhooed White House press conference with the President and the Speaker of the House and Senator Johnson was there, there's been a lot of talk about this in our state. And we want to talk, yes, but we also want to make sure we get facts in the conversation and we want to hear your questions and your concerns. Uh, so before we get started, I do want to give both uh, Amanda and Gordon, we'll go by first names tonight, I hope you're all okay with that, a little less formal on a Friday evening. Um, we want to just hear from you guys your takes on this. I am going to be watching the clock because I'm a radio guy and I just I can't just talk endlessly into the ether. So I'm just going to be watching the clock. There's no structure or any formal timing on this. I just want to keep a sense of what's going on. But just a couple minutes on basically what you're hearing, what your thoughts are, Amanda, and then Gordon, you'll go second. So you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, so mostly I would say in my district, which is the Appleton and Menasha area, overwhelmingly the contacts we have had in this area are that people are against this project. And really the main reason why are just the numbers just simply don't add up. So we're going to be paying this company $3 billion. And to be clear, we are paying them because they have no tax liability because of the manufacturing and a tax credit and some other tax credits. So this is actually a check of 200, 250 million a year to this company that is worth billions with an owner who is worth billions himself. And people just don't want to see their money going to a billionaire and see somebody getting richer off of their backs, off of their hard work. So overwhelmingly, the people in my district have been against this. You know, I would say it did pass the assembly with some Democratic votes, but I would not say it was mostly bipartisan. Um, the truth is, out of 35 Democrats, I think there were about four Democrats that voted for it. So, three? Yeah. So, um, so I would say it's not exactly a bipartisan vote, but there were some Democrats, but again, mostly those that are in the area where this is looking to be located. Gordon, what do you got to say for us here? Uh, I, mean, I mean, I think the interesting thing, and I appreciate the opportunity because this, I think, even if you are unsure, and it's easy to be unsure, um, you know, we just got the details of the package 25 days ago, um, you know, in the announcement, a uh, big press conference, and, and it was easy to be excited, big company, they wanted to invest in Wisconsin, they chose us, uh, the president was talking about it. Uh, but then we kind of got the details of the package, and and it's been hard each day to get answers to a lot of the best questions. Um, Amanda was on the Jobs and the Economy, a committee that had a hearing in the Assembly. We had to vote on it within 17 days. Um, and again, even if you wanted to be able to find a way to yes or understand, well, is this a good deal or not, by moving it so fast, you know, one, you weren't going to get answers, and two, 
uh, why are they moving so fast on something that has the potential to, you know, cost us a lot of the money. Remember, we got the economic analysis after the hearing that said uh, from the Fiscal Bureau that um, the best case scenario, if we create 13,000 jobs and have an additional 22,000 indirect jobs and we have 10,000 construction jobs, um, with the money going out and the money coming in, it'll take us a quarter century to get our money back. So the best case scenario is taxpayers will be made whole in 2042 or 2043. Um, there's a lot of reasons to think that might not happen even if something happens. We had a hearing in Racine this week um, on the Budget Committee, I'm on the Joint Finance Committee, and you know we had a lot, of, a lot of questions. I mean, there's nothing in the bill that requires the company or that has any job goals or job numbers. We're just told, oh, don't worry, you know, they're committed to it. Um, you know, first thing we hear is they're going to invest $10 billion. Uh, that's the capital investment that, you know, they pledge they will spend, make, you know, creating a big factory. And half of the tax incentives are based upon them spending $10 billion. Uh, Foxconn has pledged in the last year uh, a total of $27.8 billion dollars for two factories in China, one factory in India, and one factory in Wisconsin. If they were to spend all of that money, it would be more money than they have spent in the last 23 years. So when I say, are they likely to follow through with a $10 billion dollar investment when they've made pledges around the world in the last year of more money than they've spent in 23 years, I kind of have a red flag. Um, they're building a factory in China. One of that factory is going to produce the exact same things that we are planning on making here, large LCD screens, um, you know, at one-seventh of the labor cost that we have. Um, we've heard there'll be 13,000 jobs. Now, the Terry Gao said 3,000, um, said up to 13,000 maybe, potentially. Uh, but we hear a lot from the governor about oh, 13,000 by 2021, you know, maybe more than that. Um, and it's hard to imagine them, if they're going to spend $10 billion dollars on a factory and on equipment and they're a big automation company, it's hard to imagine them actually having 13,000 people working there. So, um, just so I don't keep rattling off because I've got more to say, I'll come up for air there. But the two right. of the biggest claims that they have, um, there's nothing, there's a lot of questions to ask about those things, and there's no language in the bill um, to ensure that those things happen. You'll hear a lot of talk about, well, they don't get the money if they don't hire the people. And that's true on the job side, but if they build a factory and they decide to close it, they get the money and they don't have to pay it back. And if I told you, in two, if, let's say it was 2005, and I said, we got it. We're going to give these guys $3 billion dollars because we're going to build a Blackberry factory. We're going to make Blackberries for the next 15 years and we'll get our money back in 25 years. Or maybe it was 1988 and we said, we're going to make VHSs. It's going to be great. You might say, does anybody know if we're going to make LCD screens in 15 years, 20 years? Interesting. All right. Well, that is, uh, that's one perspective on this. I think you raised a lot of good questions. Amanda and Gordon, thank you for that. Um, we are going to take questions from the audience, but I just want to set the stage, kind of get the conversation rolling uh, by trying to establish some shared facts on some of this, and it relates to some of the things that Amanda and Gordon have already said. Um, first, yes, the Legislative Fiscal Bureau came out with an analysis that says, uh, based on the bill, would they estimate $200 million dollars a year in payments being made based on the performance of Foxconn, which would mean all in with the indirect and direct jobs. As Gordon described it, it would take 25 years for the state to break even on what they would pay out based on what they would then be collecting. Uh, can we agree that that's what the Legislative Fiscal Bureau analysis said? Money out, money in, right. best, best case. Correct, based on the assumptions that were given to them by Foxconn and the governor, right? By the company. By the company, yes, the, the economic analysis that was done for them. Okay, that analysis says that they are promising to create thousands of jobs and invest billions of dollars, and as you pointed out, Gordon, they've done that elsewhere, and it has not materialized. So we may have reason to suspect that their promises might not be fulfilled. We don't know. We don't know. Can I, can I just say something about the, the, yeah. 10, the 10 billion yep. dollar? Yep. So I just want to say, right in um, one analysis that was done, Foxconn has already said five billion of that off the top is actually being imported from overseas and not actually being done here or created here. 
So give me a sense of what would be imported, like a machine? I believe it's materials, machines, that kind of thing. Do you know so, for sure what is in there? Don't. I'm not sure exactly all of the materials that fall under that, but I just know it says right in the analysis that they've already said $5 billion of that $10 billion investment is being imported, so it isn't even coming from here to begin with. So just based on your understanding of this, uh, half of that $10 billion capital investment would be materials purchased from outside the country. Yes. Now, do you know if that property would be taxable as personal property in the state of Wisconsin? Would it generate local or state tax revenues once it's here? Yeah, I think there, I mean, I, I don't know. And of course, we were looking at changing the personal right. property tax in the next two weeks. And so right. maybe. Okay. <laughs> I, I just, the reason I ask is because I want to make sure if it's not purchased here, it can still generate positive economic impact here. Uh, but. Well, I know as part of the bill, they do have a lot of other exemptions like sales tax and that yep. kind. Yep. Um, so I'm not sure what other taxes it might be subject to perhaps okay. there might be some but okay. there are so many exemptions in here i don't believe there'd be a lot yeah. of tax that they would be liable for because of it well let's move on then to those specifics in the incentive package um there are incentives here for employee payroll that would be paid out these are refundable tax credits because um as you said the manufacturing and ag tax credit has reduced the state income tax rate for businesses near to zero if you're a manufacturer or an agricultural business right yeah, okay, just want to make sure that uh, we're all on the same page with this. Um, so if their corporate tax rate is already close to zero, a tax credit really only does them any good if it's refundable because they don't have much tax to pay and so there's not really much to offset. And so these do, this is where that notion of cash payments come from, is because these credits we talk about are refundable. So there are certain credits you might qualify in your personal income taxes that you get to take off the amount you pay into your taxes. If you don't have any taxes to pay in, you can't take anything off of your tax liability because you don't have one. The idea here is rather than taking it off a liability, it's, oh, you don't have a liability? Okay, it's refundable. We're just going to pay you the money. That's what a refundable tax credit is. And these are common practice for individuals as well as businesses. There's all different kinds of tax credits that are refundable. This is not something new. This is the way they designed it. And this is something that could be changed in legislation. Uh, but this is there's a reason they have it designed this way, I suspect. Um, Okay, so there's credits in there for job creation, there's credits in there for capital investment, that's where the $10 billion investment in plant and machinery comes from. There's also an exemption from sales tax for construction materials purchased in the construction of this plant. Those are the three big buckets. Am I missing anything on what's in the incentive package just as it comes to financial incentives? No, other, but you know, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I can argue both sides if you want me to, you know, help you out on the other side. I mean, I'll just say, you know, the argument that we get on the other side is, well, you don't, they don't get it unless they, you know, spend it. They right, so that's another five. Credit yeah. for each, you know. It's so based they, on performance. Correct. Um, but I mentioned that best case scenario, if, if they invest in the property, you know, to the maximum amount, they get the credit. But if they only hire 3,000 people, um, they get, you know, the credit for 3,000, but the revenue that, you know, the, the best case scenario on revenue, um, you know, we wouldn't get paid off until 2058. Uh, so, you know, because part of the best case scenario of uh, maximum credits and maximum employees hired is the tax revenue that it generates from having so many people working, you know, in the area. Right. So I remind people that about the best case scenario only because there are some, you know, alternative scenarios, you could say, well, if they make the investment and they spend it all to invest in a factory with automated, you know, robots and other things, um, maybe they won't hire the full amount of people. And so they will exhaust the full credit by 2026 for the capital side and not, they won't spend the whole credit by only hiring 3,000 people. But again, we won't get that revenue and the benefit of having an additional 10,000 people working in addition to the 3,000. So, I mean, you know, it's hard to estimate you know, what the scenarios, you know, are when you're trying to calculate from a state taxpayer investment standpoint, you know, what the, uh, what, how this is going to play out. Yeah. Well, so um, one of the things you mentioned before, Gordon, was, um, right, if we were building a VHS player factory, we probably wouldn't be looking 40 years out into the future thinking that was still going to be there because we know VHS tapes were uh, made obsolete by DVDs and could flat screen TVs be suffering the same fate in the near future. Um, any financial projection that gets done more than 10 years out in the future, uh, how do you feel about that? Should we believe financial projections that are made 10 years or more out into the future regarding to the budget, regarding to this? Should we buy those numbers? Or is that too far out to know anything with certainty enough to be the basis for debate? 
Um, the budget numbers are pretty conservative, meaning the ones that have been done by the Fiscal Bureau, I think, are, here's the math, but they, 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 they put qualifiers in there like that we don't really know what's going to happen. Um, the one thing we've seen, I mean, these LCD screens, they're, they're popular now. There has been a little bit of a dip the last two years in consumer demand, uh, and there's enhanced competition, but, you know, more... I mean, they've been saying that there's going to be more business demand, uh, hospital demand, these types of things. But from the consumer market, you know, I mean, the tastes change so dramatically, it's hard to say. There also seems to be a lot of faith that, well, they will adapt. You know, so if maybe LCD screens aren't made in five years, they'll change to something else. And I ask the question, is there anything stopping them from coming back to us and asking for more money to retrofit the factory? And right. they said, you know, no, they can do that, you know, if they want to. Yeah. Um, you know, that didn't really satisfy me, so. Yeah. Amanda, you were on the assembly committee that held the only hearing that has happened so far on this bill. Is that well, right? Well, there's been two. It came through the Jobs and Economy, and we had a hearing there, and Joint Finance also had their hearing. They did, it. that's yeah. right. They had their hearing earlier this week, I believe, uh, last week, sometime recently. Um, in the hearing that you were there for, did you hear anything from company officials or, say, the state chamber or others advocating for this project not inside of government that were talking about the economic conditions, the long-term viability of this plan? Did anybody sort of make that case or address that concern? Yeah. Um, so we had, it was like a 10-hour hearing that we had, yeah. and the majority of people who got to speak were people... Um, you know, either lobbyists or somebody connected with industries that feel like they might profit from this coming in. The general public really didn't get to talk till about 9.30 at night. Um, so we didn't get to hear a lot from the general public. Uh, but we did have a lot of testimony. Um, there were certainly groups that testified claiming that this would bring in economic benefits. When I asked them to point to any data or other scenarios where something like this paid off, quite frankly, they couldn't. So I said, so what are you basing what are you basing your opinion on, saying this is going to be great for your business, this is going to be great for the economy, and they would say well, they just think it's going to be, or they just feel it's going to be. Uh, and quite frankly, even some of the businesses that were there testifying, saying, hey, maybe we would get business because of this company coming in, well, I would ask them, okay, well, why are you here? You know, you came here, and as far as I remember, we didn't vote to give you $3 billion to come in, so why did you come? And they would say, well, we came because of the university system. We came because of your workforce. So they cited many other reasons. And to be clear, Foxconn had already been looking at this area for many other reasons. They cited that they were coming here because of our workforce, because of our proximity to Chicago, because of our water resources. And so to me, there's a lot of other reasons why a company would come here that we don't have to bribe them with $3 billion, that there's a lot of other reasons companies come here, and companies that come here because of our UW system, or companies that grow here or start here because of our UW system, aren't just going to take off and leave and they get the next tax incentive package. So the last fact that I want to try to establish here is that Wisconsin has historically been near the bottom, or at least in the bottom half of states, when it comes to job creation. And at the end of the list, i.e. 50th, in new business startups, so if we have such a welcoming business climate without incentives, what, what do you think attributes to that poor record of job creation and business startups? I mean, I have two, two guesses. Um, I mean, there is something cultural about us that is less, we're a little more risk averse on the uh, entrepreneurial side. Um, the one thing we'll say is, you know, we have uh, fewer startups, but the startups that we do have tend to, um, we have a higher percentage of success. Um, and, you know, it's, it's been 50 at the last few years, but it wasn't much higher 10 or 15 years ago. Right. So I'm not going to throw that around, even though it, it is thrown around. And we're certainly probably not doing enough to incentivize and encourage uh, through our research institutions. Um, you know, on the jobs front, I've kind of pivoted on this one. <clears throat> Wisconsin doesn't have, we have a people problem. I mean, we are one of the oldest states. We're the 15 oldest in the country. Um, the Racine-Kenosha area are two of the counties that have the fastest loss of working age people, people 25 to 54 years old. So now we're talking about building a company in a place that has uh, 10,000 fewer working age people than it did five years ago. Um, by 2040, the state's gonna have 110,000 fewer uh, working age people. And so we've got low unemployment, we've got slow job growth. So the question really is, will 20 bucks an hour, which is the starting pay at Foxconn, be enough to recruit people from all over the world to move to Racine? Um, on the floor debate the other, in the hearing the other day, that they, that's what they were saying. And you know, yeah, yeah, they will. 
they'll move to Wisconsin Valley, and um, you know, I, I think that you know, my, my 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 concern is if you have a worker shortage, and what if, what if twenty bucks an hour doesn't get people to come, and they have to increase it to thirty bucks an hour? Is the company who got rid of sixty thousand workers in China two years ago and replaced them with robots more likely to pay more? or look at more automation. And so, I mean, you know, this this market issue, I mean, I can only make a real assessment with what the information is right yeah. now. And so, I think the slow job growth uh, has some, you know, if, if you have low unemployment and sl uh, slow job growth, a lot of it is that you have a people problem. And we know employers in Northeast Wisconsin are having a hard time filling a lot of jobs. We just hear more about skilled labor, but to be honest with you, it's, it's all working age people. And you ask, well, why aren't people moving here? Um, if the headlines are uh, animal waste in drinking water, uh, cuts in schools, and declining investment in universities, that's not a you know real big selling point. Yeah, I mean I would just add that we do have an image problem. Um, people really, if you're not from Wisconsin, they have a perception we just sit out here in the cold with our cows drinking beer, and we don't do a good job of changing that image right now. Um, and so it's a hard to bring in those young millennials, uh, but certainly. You know, even when we look at um, some of the testimony, we did have somebody from Generator there who does work with startups. And in an article, he was quoted as saying he was concerned that because of the liability this puts on our, our budget and our taxes, that we're actually going to see support for things like Generator or funds for startups diminish because that'll be one of the first things to go when we need to come up with our 200, 250 million check that year for this company. And that also it's more about some of the social policies that have been coming out of the administration that actually drive those millennials away, drive those people who are in those tech industries away from Wisconsin. So I think that's a big part of it. I do want to also follow up on something Gordon said though. So he talked about $20 an hour when the truth is that the incentives actually start at 30000 a year, which is more like $14, $15 an hour. Which and is so, very close to the uh, beginning wage at manufacturing facilities in this area as well as around the rest of the state. That's yeah, a so typical starting wage. So I'm just saying wage. it's yep. not, again, to Gordon's point, I don't think that people are going to necessarily be flocking from other areas just because of that wage. And when we look at um, the Buildings Trade Union, you know, they've said themselves, we only have 10,000 people total in Wisconsin. We know we can't fulfill these jobs. We know. Uh, you know, first of all, I would say Foxconn didn't even come to the, our committee hearing. They had nobody there, so they didn't even bother to come testify while they expect us to give them $3 billion. But we know that other people who were there speaking in support of this even said, yeah, of course people are going to come from Illinois to work here because of the proximity. So the truth is we'll be paying as Wisconsin taxpayers for Illinois workers to come across the border and work here. Yeah. So the last thing I want to get established here before we'll open it up for questions, this is my last thing before we turn to the audience. Um, a lot of the case being made for this project is based on assumptions, right? It's based on projections, it's based on promises, it's based on guesses. A lot of the criticism of this package has been based on guesses, on concerns, on questions that aren't answered. Is this an opportunity of such a scale that we as a state need to, as Gordon said, we're more risk averse culturally than most places. Is this an opportunity where we need to bite hard and take that risk because of the huge potential benefits? Or do you believe that those potential benefits aren't worth the risks that you see in this project? Amanda, we'll start with you. Sure. I mean, I would say certainly it's sometimes good to take risk. And like, you know, we look at WEDIC, sometimes projects fail, but in order to get <laughs> projects that do turn out well, sometimes you have to take those risks. I would say this risk goes doesn't make sense. You know, there's something to taking smart risks. When we've had three different analysis come out all showing that we're really not going to get the jobs that are being talked about, that we're not going to get the return on investment unless it's 25 years later and every single thing goes right, which in reality, in your lives, has anything ever always gone just perfectly right? So I just think that this is a risk that just doesn't make sense. Certainly, I think that government has a role in supporting business, in creating incentives, but they have to make sense and you have to actually see a return on investment in order for it to be something that you actually put taxpayer money in. So is there some report or some analysis or some number or some data point that you could be shown that would bring you around to support something like this? Or are you just, there's, there's no way you could get behind a proposal like this? So when I first got this proposal, I actually sat down with some economic professors from Lawrence and from other places around here to ask them. 
like what would be a better number? Like, is there a formula economists use to say X or percentage of X, Y, and Z make sure you'll get a return on investment and would be a good deal? Is there anything economists agree on in terms of these kinds of packages that you know I could maybe put forward as an idea or a suggestion? Because certainly it wasn't about just saying no. We would we would love to have companies come here. We would love to have more jobs than we could handle. I mean, nobody is against jobs coming here, but it has to be something that makes sense. And what I heard over and over again from the economists that I talked to, from the articles that have come out, is that these kinds of deals truly never really pay off. And economists across the board, the majority of them say, this is not the best use of money. That you're actually better off investing in your roads and your schools and those kinds of projects if you want to really help your economy in terms of what the government can do. Um, so at this point, I can't say an exact number. I mean, I would say if it was a lower amount and we would see a return on investment in a shorter amount of time, that would be a safer bet, possibly. Um, but because that's not something that's been offered or talked about is something I'd be willing to do. At this point, I don't see how I could support it. Okay, and if you want to hear more from Lawrence University Professor of Economics David Girard, that's one of the professors that Amanda talked to, he was my guest on Fresh Take on Wednesday. You can find podcasts of my episodes on whby.com if you want to go check those out for more information. Um, Gordon, thoughts on risk, risk taking, yeah. and is there anything that could bring you around on this? Well, I mean, uh, I, I too, I mean, I'm willing to take some risk. I mean, look, the, you, when you say, uh, you know, Foxconn, global companies looking to invest in your state. Um, we could usually certainly use an injection of tech, uh, applied manufacturing. Um, there's a lot to be, you know, excited about. Of course, by nature, politicians want to say, like, look what I'm doing. And I think there's a lot of that going on right now. Um, you know, part of my caution from the beginning was the reputation both of our governor, who's had a history of overpromising and underperforming when it comes to giving away hundreds of millions of dollars and not having much to show for it, and a company who has a history of doing the same thing. Um, you know, that being said, uh, we're always trying to make the bill better. You know, there are amendments and there's other things, and even the other day we were really pushing for, well, can we do anything so if they pack up and leave after we've given them full credit, you know, we can get something back. I'll be honest with you, the three billion is a hard, hard thing to do. Um, we're, if we make it through 2019 with no recession, we will be in the longest period of national economic growth in U.S. history. It will be the longest period without a depression. And during the longest period without a depression, we have gutted our UW system. We have cut funding. For okay, I'm, I'm going to cut you off on that one. You can save that for the campaign trail. but. I, I want to know specifically, is there some change to this that could be made that would bring you around on this or no? I mean, whether or not the Republicans would be willing to do it, is there something that could be done in this package of incentives that would make you support it? I mean, if it was located in Oshkosh, would you support it? It'd be a tougher thing in Oshkosh. I think even the people who are voting for it, and my colleagues in Kenosha and Racine are, are voting for it not because they think it's a good deal, but because... How's this? There's a big difference in people who are drink they're a little thirstier for the kool-aid being served in southeastern wisconsin and amanda's right and i've talked to economy you know been in contact with economists that have no skin in the game nationally if you look at what boeing did in washington if you look at the biggest this is the largest taxpayer funded subsidy of a foreign company in united states history and if you look at the track record objectively for people that have no skin in the game they'll tell you these things don't work out now i'm telling you if we're going to go forward with this, I hope I'm 100% wrong, and this is the greatest thing that ever happened. Now, uh, Tim Sheehy of the yep. Metropolitan Milwaukee uh, Business Group said, if half of this happens, he'll be thrilled. Um, when I talked to the same people, I was we were having a public hearing, you know, I was laughing with Secretary Neitzel afterwards. He's like, we don't really know what's going to happen. We'll have to find out in 10 years. That's and right. I'm like, ha, 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 that could cost us a lot of money. Right, right. So that, I mean, that part is absolutely true. And Republicans that I have talked to on my show, I've talked to a few of them, um, they are not saying this is all absolutely going to happen. They know enough not to make that promise uh, because of the track record uh, of the company, but also just the uncertainties of the economy. Gordon, your point about the fact that we, as far, I'll just say this, we are due for a recession in this country. And if we were to launch on something like this and then a recession hits, we could be on the hook for a lot of promises that may not deliver in the sense that that Legislative Fiscal Bureau analysis predicted that it might. But that's just what it is, is predictions and projections. And the last thing I'll share, you both have said that economists agree that this kind of thing doesn't work. And just to show you that you can find a study that will prove anything, um, 
Michael Greenstone was an economist that was uh, involved in the Obama administration. He works at MIT, and uh, he, there is an analysis uh, that he did. The title of the study is Bidding for Industrial Plants. Does winning a million dollar plant increase welfare? And the analysis concludes with this. Overall, the results undermine the popular view that the provision of local subsidies to attract large industrial plants reduces local residents' welfare. So what they found is, actually, wages go up and property values go up when you're the winning county relative to the county that loses. That was the model of their study. So there's ways you can design these studies to prove anything you want. I'm not saying that that means we shouldn't listen to any study. What I'm saying is no study is definitive on these questions. So um, consensus is powerful, uh, but individual studies can show you anything you want to find. Uh, so just a, a bit of caution thrown into the mix in this conversation as we open it up to the audience. And I'm curious, if you do have questions, we want you to have your questions answered or at least get them on the floor. Uh, we're not passing a microphone around. And I will say this, if there's shouting or speaking out of turn or other things. Even by us? You guys are exe you're exempt. You can talk as much as you want, Gordon, and I know you're good Oscar. at it. Yes. <laughs> but in the context of this, this is not turning into one of those town hall meetings you see on TV. I don't know that anybody here wants that. If you do, you can leave right now. Because if it turns into that, this will end very quickly. Okay, so I just want to set that as an expectation. Can we all agree on that? Yes. Okay. I mean, feel free to ask any. Feel free to ask any question, including something we already said. Yeah. I mean, Amanda Absolutely. and I've been drinking out of a fire hose for yeah. the last four weeks, and and some of the we probably some of the things we said may have come out, you know, fast and not right. made sense. So feel free to Absolutely. ask. Absolutely, we can cover what, things. What is Foxconn? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Maybe we should start with that. No, we'll start where you want to start. Who's got a question that they would like to ask? Who wants to go first? Be the brave, the brave guinea pig to start things out. Absolutely. Yeah, stand up, just right. shout it out. I'll try to talk loud so everyone can hear me. You Thank said you. we weren't supposed to shout. Uh, <laughs> out of turn, out of turn, Larry, out of turn. All right, so first off, 250 million a year payment, correct? Is that 200 to 250. At the, yeah. at the peak. Right. Okay. Just kind of a, we can offset that by expanding Magic Care. Just saying. Uh, one of the Republicans' mantras or, or slogans is, uh, you know, we're always going to get money back, get money back. Uh, people know how to spend their money best. They can spend their money best. Now all of a sudden, they know how to spend it for me, and a lot of it for me. Um, another point, um, Gordon, you have a, a, a son? Daughter. Daughter, how old is she? Four months. Four months. I have a five-week-old child. Our kids will graduate college before we're out of the red. You know, think about that. Um, up to 13,000 jobs. You know, up to, on my way home, I will drive up to 150 miles an hour on the way home. At my job, I will make up to $400,000 this year. Not going to happen. Um, the other thing is, even at 13,000 jobs, uh, under Scott Walker's watch, you still don't get 250000 That's all I got. But, so I, I think there's some good points just in terms of what else could we do with this money if we really do want to help our economy. And I would say, you know, a couple things. First of all, uh, those of us in the Fox Valley know that Appleton Coded is in receivership right now. We know Graphic Packaging in Menasha has closed. We know Oscar Mayer left Madison. And so the truth is that if we do want to look at helping companies, we'd be better off looking at some of the companies that are already here and keeping them, because we could probably keep them for a lot less money. Um, but also, there's other things we could invest in. So if we took the Medicaid money, that was projected to bring in, I think, like 10,000 jobs, and it wouldn't have cost us anything. If we were growing green energy jobs, we know that that would be a huge increase in jobs, and again, jobs that are likely to stay here, not just pick up and leave. Amanda, can I just jump in on that for a second? Um, I've heard lots of people, not just Democrats, but people who are questioning this package, saying the $3 billion could be spent better elsewhere. Now, you made a very specific example Appleton coded in combined locks going into receivership. Do you believe it would be worthwhile to get LFB to do the analysis on bailing out or rescuing or buying or however you want to characterize it, Appleton coded? Because my question when you say that is, what's the payoff? And how long before we break even? Because that's the criticism I'm hearing of this deal. It's, oh, it takes 25 years to pay back. How long would it take to pay back a bailout of Appleton coded? I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I'm looking for an apples to apples comparison. Is that realistic? 
I, I think it would be a good question. I mean, because certainly, uh, you know, we know this kind of thing has been done before. Uh, we know Governor Doyle, I believe it was, helped uh, Marinette Marine. Right, Mercury Marine Mercury and Fond du Lac. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think it would be worth asking, was it worth it? I mean, I think it would be worth looking back to find out in the future, do we know if this is the best way to use money or yeah. is it not? Um, so I think it's worth looking at. But the point more is just that while we're talking about all these jobs coming in, there are also jobs leaving other places. And is it worthwhile to look at what we could do there versus solely focusing on one company that is in one part of the state versus other parts of the state where we're seeing companies leave? Yeah. Gordon, I'll, I'll just say this. I mean, when we say, you know, economists say, um, you know, because they study these things, it's, it's a tougher argument to make because you're saying that there's a better investment of up to $3 billion that you could spend on something else that might better support, you know, if we put broadband in rural areas right. that can't compete for jobs right now, you could say we might be more successful. A lot of companies are looking to locate in states that are investing in early childhood education because they see the long-term benefit to it. Or public transportation. But, uh, or, I'll be honest yeah, with right. you, as a Healthcare. politician, is it sexier to say, like, I'm going to bring 13,000 jobs in this global company to Racine, or, well, if we invest in universal broadband, and you know, it's, it's it's a so I mean our argument against is 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 more complicated and more difficult and again even when I talked to the guys I was arguing with in the hearing the other day ten years from now we might still be arguing as to whether this has been right. good now I was in office when we did the uh, uh, package for Mercury and the package yeah. for Oshkosh Corp yeah. and it was like sixty million over ten years and what it was was for every new employee that you hired you got a seven percent credit on each new employee only if you hired them. So they may, over 10 years, they may never have utilized the full amount of the credit. Uh, for Oshkosh Corp, it was 35 million, and they baked that into the contract bid that they made to get a federal contract. Now, this was also at the height of the recession, but even at $60 million, Mercury's deal, that's 1 60th of what we're talking here. It was an established company that unfortunately was playing us off in other states. But again, you only got the credit for the you know employee when we came out of the recession, um, you know I'm not saying you know there were some of us that had uneasy feelings as to whether this was the best you know most cost effective use, but you were talking about different money, yeah, yeah. sixty million over ten years, yeah. maybe if it's ever fully utilized, um, is different than. Uh, Three billion. I just want to be clear, though, that notion of if it's ever fully utilized applies to this package as well. Totally. Right. Okay. I just want. To, yep. Absolutely. Um, other questions? Yeah. Absolutely. Just make sure you speak nice and loud. Yep. All right. So the average worker in Wisconsin right now gets paid. It's under thirty. Only makes about twenty thousand dollars a year. Those are workers under thirty. Under thirty. Okay. Okay. Now those workers under thirty, though, there are a lot of them have that degree nowadays that Foxconn looks for for these jobs. That's going to roughly, the average one of them is going to make $54,000 a year. If you want to talk about drawing young people into a state, crazy. That ain't fun for them. We'll help them. zero in on one piece of that, which is a higher average wage being offered in these jobs. Whoa. <laughs> I didn't do it. Would that be enough to draw the talent into the state that could actually fill these jobs? Amanda? Uh, I mean, there's something to be said for higher wages, right? People are going to go for higher wages, but again, these are sort of manufacturing jobs. These aren't tech jobs. These are manufacturing jobs. And I, I just don't see that that is where young people are being drawn to right yeah. now. You know, my husband's a sheet metal journeyman. I know they have a hard time getting young people. Any sort of these manufacturing laboring jobs, right. they're just hard. I mean, certainly the higher the pay goes, the more likely, but again, that's not what Fox kind of saying. When they're only starting at 30,000 for incentives, if you look at some of their other plants with their advertising for jobs, it's actually more like eight, nine dollars an hour. So I, I just don't know. And on top of that, these younger people, they care about things like their environment. So when we talk about Foxconn being waived from permits and being able to fill in wetlands and stuff, again, when that's what people are seeing and hearing, 
that's not going to draw them. And yeah. In fact, I was talking to some of my family out in Boston who are millennials, and they were saying, well, this millennial is not going to move to Wisconsin yeah. to work in a manufacturing yeah. plant. Um, so I, you know, I just, I don't really think truly that we're going to be seeing fifty thousand dollar jobs based on what they were looking for for credits. No, that is the stated average of jobs of these three thousand that are or are promised to be created. So you just don't buy that number. Well, an average. So you could have a few people making a couple hundred thousand dollars, and then the majority making thirty or right. less. You know, I mean, it's an average. So. Right. As opposed to a median, which would tell you or is half above well, we, and half and we've above. had complicated medians. First, I just want to say that I am, you know, I'm sympathetic to that argument, and I think that in the best case scenario, especially with some of the other um, indirect jobs around this idea, you know, would be one of the ideas to sell it. However, there are a lot of things that draw people, and Wisconsin is one of 11 states in the country that has cut higher education in the last four years. Other states are investing hard because uh, they see the benefit. And of course, the majority of our jobs in Wisconsin have been created in Dane County, where they have the big research institution, uh, UW-Madison. I will say this, the, so in the Ernst & Young report that I have here, for the 13,000 jobs, 75% of the jobs that they list of the 13,000 would be hourly operators and techs, presumably starting at 41.6 which would mean the median wage is actually about 41.6. Yeah. So then you're looking at 20 bucks an hour. Um, now there would be benefits. Uh, they said that they anticipate they will need to work 20% uh, overtime, although that's not calculated in the wage. Right. Um, the one thing I need to say, because I was going to say this earlier, uh, this is the Baker Tilly report. There's three reports, yep. two Baker Tilly reports and one Ernst & Young. But these companies say, and this is the qualifier on the Baker Tilly report, quote, all information contained in the report which others furnished was, a, uh, wait, all information contained in the report which others furnished was assumed to be true, correct, and reliable. A reasonable effort was made to verify such information, but the author assumes no responsibility for its accuracy. Right. So in other words, these companies who were hired to put together an assessment were given all of their information by the company who wants the assistance. But wouldn't a, a disclaimer like that, similar to those words, be applicable to LFB estimates as well? They just have to take the data they get and they can't be held responsible right, for but it. Now you're talking about a, 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 a budget analysis that is saying, we can only work with the data we get, and then the people that put the data together are like, we don't really know that this data is that good because the company gave it to us. I'm just saying, after you yeah. say that a couple times, yeah. you say, look, this is what they're saying. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's, yeah. you know, like I said, and, and, and that's, you know, I think at 20 bucks an hour, you're not gonna be able to get anybody. And then, so my question is, I hope they pay more um, to get people, let the market work. If you pay more, it'll draw people in. My fear is that instead of doing that, because look, we've got a major labor shortage in Wisconsin and in manufacturing, not only did we lose 4,000 jobs last year in manufacturing, we saw wages drop 5%. You say, well, we have a labor shortage. What's happening? Wages should be going up. Some of it could be older workers retiring, being replaced by younger workers. Um, but a lot of it's probably, if I can't hire somebody at 15 bucks an hour, I'm going to invest in uh, equipment and you know replace them with automation. I, I also want to point out in the um, Ernst & Young report that Gordon was just mentioning, by their own analysis, the benefit they bring to the state with other businesses co coming because of them and because of their employees spending money in the state, that benefit is only 181 million a year versus them getting 200 to 250 million a year. So you can see there's a deficit by their own analysis of the benefit they bring in with all those ancillary benefits that you mentioned. So there's still a deficit there, but they're getting from taxpayers versus what they're bringing into the state. Uh, but does that include like local property taxes, sales That's taxes? Includes, yep, includes it says in there, it says okay. employees spending money in the yep, community, yep, okay. other businesses coming, right. coming because of them. Okay, great. Um, other thoughts on this notion uh, before we take another question? Anything else you want to add before we... Um, I'll just say what, uh, one other thing, and this came up, it was good to have the hearing in Racine the other day because we had yeah. officials from southeastern Wisconsin. Um, the state commitment is, could be, up to $3 billion. Um, but normally in these big packages we've seen around the nation, about 40% of it happens to be local incentives. So we could see a mega TIF uh, assistance hooking people up to uh, Lake Michigan water uh, as much as $2 billion. So then you'd be looking at a potentially a $5 billion deal. Um, there's still you know, plenty of questions locally. Who's gonna, you know, untreated wastewater from a highly chemical intensive process, who's gonna pay for that? 
I just want to clarify that TIP assistance is not cash payments, but that would be municipal spending where they're directing things. And we can get into TIP if anybody's interested in that, but that's a whole other story. It would not be cash payments. It would not be cash okay. payments, but they would, they've extended it to a 30 year payoff. Right. And I, you know, yeah. I could get into a big headache, but one of the risks is if the value created inside that TIF is so high, the only way that the city or the municipality can get that increment is by raising property taxes on everybody outside of the TIF. Right. We will get into TIF a little more later. Super nerdy. When we get into the amendment package that was added on to this bill, um, there is changes to the TIF law, and I've got questions for you guys about that. But Amanda's got one more thing, and then we'll take another question. Well, I just want to add about the $20 an hour. We actually tried to do an amendment saying that they would have to be $20 an hour in order to get the credits, and so that basically failed on party floor. line. Yeah, okay. So trying to make sure that if they're saying it's going to be $20 an hour, that it really would be, but we couldn't even get that passed. Sure. So you were trying to basically put into the bill that the only jobs that would qualify for incentives would be those at that You have to be $20 at least $20 an hour. hour. Yeah, and that did not pass. Okay. Um, next question from the audience. Anybody have questions or comments that they want to share in the discussion? Yeah. educated people we've got one of the best research universities as you said Gordon in the world and yet we can't keep those people here right uh, and you don't see Foxconn making a difference in that uh, no I mean I said earlier that my hopes would be and I understand the appeal and the best case scenario but you know there's also trade-offs we also know that people under 30 want to live in places that have uh, quality public transportation and that's something we've significantly underfunded I mean we know we have enough data we have enough polling on where young people are choosing to live um, and the reasons why um, to combine his points, your points, and your question earlier about what it would take to support, um, when I was looking at uh, um, incentives, one of the disappointing things about the $3 billion is that it all went to the company. Um, it didn't, you know, there was no money provided for customized job training. In other words, if some of the incentives have gone to uh, underemployed or some of the uh, unemployed minority community that we know we have in Racine that's traditionally had high unemployment or uh, gone to connect um, Milwaukee's population that you know, is in need of better employment through enhanced public transportation, um, customized labor training has a much bigger return than tax incentives, and so you know it would be easier to stomach uh, tax dollars as part of an incentive package going uh, into our population to be able to assist this company that will profit off of that kind of investment. Um, you know, after the fact, we saw that because we don't because we don't have enough money in this budget. Um, you know, they said, oh, oh, we're going to put 20 million in the next budget to help the universities uh, train people for here. But you know, as part of the big sticker, uh, three billion, it would have been nice to see and easier to justify some of the assistance. Because again, the company's going to benefit from that assistance, but so is the worker, so is a Wisconsin resident. That if that company doesn't pay off, they're going to have that training, that skill, you know, to be able to go into something else and it'll stay with them. Yeah. Basically, you're talking about, you can, for example pay a local technical college to run a mechanical engineering course so that people who don't have the skills to get hired at Foxconn would then have those skills and they would take those skills with them whether it's a Foxconn or anywhere else. Right, because we're not now, what we're going to do is we're going to shift re resources that are pretty slim to those programs anyway, which right. will be an additional benefit to the company and yes, you know, to the student, but it's going to come at the expense of some other things and no. I just feel like, you know, that, that's a lot. You know, we mean, we'd be doing a lot for them to provide them with a skilled workforce ready to yeah. go, which would be easier to support. Now, didn't the assembly amendment add some extra spending that was at least partially designated for worker training? Yeah, but not until the next budget. Ah, 1921. Okay, 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 so those new dollars actually kick in in the 1921 fiscal year. Because we don't have any money. Okay. <laughs> Amanda, thoughts on that? Anything? Yeah. Okay. Uh, other Set questions? Um... One of the things, oh, I'm sorry, go right ahead. Oh, well, yep. No, with the, yep, with the red, with the red, yep. All right. We'll come to you. It 
impact statement. Yes. Yep. That um, they're going to fast track it. They're going to be sure to follow all the rules. I, I just don't quite understand what I'm hearing from Tim and what I'm seeing. So, do you guys have anything to say about that? Can I jump on that one first, just to put some some groundwork on that? What I've been told, and this is uh, from Democrats and Republicans that I've talked to about this, all federal environmental regulations and requirements would still be in force. That the exemption that is being put in here for Foxconn is that they do not have to file what is typically required by any other business in Wisconsin, which is an environmental impact statement of new construction that they would be doing. In addition to that, the other changes current law requires any wetlands that are destroyed in construction be replaced with one acre destroyed be replaced with 1.2 acres of new this requires for every one acre destroyed two acres to replace them but there's no requirement about where those two acres are created so if they destroy them in racine county they could recreate them in rusk county um, or anywhere else in the state there is no requirement on that am i understanding that properly does that fit with what you guys understand about the environmental piece of the package itself well, Gordon will, I think, will answer most of this, but I'll just add a few things. That certainly where they end up being located, because we don't really know for sure. I mean, it's all speculation from here. But certainly depending on where they go, they could have more or less wetlands that they might fill in or whatever it may be, because it kind of depends on where it is. You said uh, that they already know, but it wasn't announced yet. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, they haven't shared it with us. <laughs> but but to be, that was part of the discussion. Is that yes, depending on where they go, again, it depends on what the environment is in that area that they decide to build. Uh, but it is concerning. Yes, federal rules would still apply. Uh, but you're you're still messing with one of our greatest assets here, and one of the reasons why people come here. If you want to talk about the economy, tourism is a huge industry here. And if we do start messing with our wetlands, start messing with our environment, then you're hurting the heart of like large segment of our economy. So it's something to keep in mind. And millennials, they don't want to come work where it's dirty, where wetlands are filled in. They want good communities. They care about the environment. So if you want to attract them to work somewhere, certainly a, a place that's just allowed to forgo all permitting. And if we're going without the environmental impact statement, the truth is we don't really know what the impact will be. We don't know all the unknowns out there without doing that, which is why it's so important, why it's a concern that it is being waived. And so there are a lot of concerns about the environmental impact. I know Gordon had some more to say about yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I can understand the lifting of the state, you know, to the federal designation as a from a permitting process. They all they want to speed it up. Okay, um, but we still have wetlands that the state designates that aren't federal. Um, so that's a question. Um, the filling in of the wetlands, it sounds great as two to one, but I'll tell you, yesterday we had a uh, motion on the Joint Finance Committee in the budget to dedicate $14 million to the Ashley Furniture Company in Arcadia. Um, Fifteen years ago, we gave them permission to build on a site and fill in wetlands and replace it with new wetlands that they created. The problem is water wants to go where it will go. and. Uh, what's happened is they've had massive flooding so now we're going to spend 14 million dollars to help them build you know fix their floodplain which is a direct result of you know bad decision making related to wetlands uh there's been a lot of flooding in southeastern wisconsin recently they had 17 million gallons of untreated wastewater from the four county area go into the fox river down there and i'm not my geography is not that great uh, one of my big concerns, and, and these are questions for the locals who all sort of seemed on board, but um, this is a chemical intensive process. A lot of the minerals that were rattled off the other day at the hearing, um, you know, are things that are a big concern. Uh, who's going to be responsible for the treatment of, uh, you know, untreated wastewater? Uh, even in China, there's been some environmental concerns. Again, the LCD process, we know it's water intensive, it's chemical intensive. I just want to make sure that in our exuberance to get this project done, we're not thinking about what these consequences are. I don't think anybody's going to look to uh, pollute, but it is their first U.S. plant. We do have higher standards here, and it is a concern. Um, even, you know, John Torinas the other day is definitely, uh, you know, more conservative and, and is a proponent of the project, I think, highlighted that, well, why don't they uh, share their environmental management statement? And we, I tried to put that in the budget yesterday just so every company does one, just so the public can see it, because clearly they'll have to have some system in place for how they plan to deal with it. Uh, but it, it, you know, it raises a lot of questions. That's enough. You know, I think there's probably a lot of businesses in Wisconsin who are like, you know, I wouldn't mind 
getting the DNR off my back too. Yeah. yeah. I've definitely heard that a lot from my listeners, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Ma'am, did you have a question that you wanted to ask? Concern? I just wanted to yeah. say, I think a lot of the things we talked about are sexier than 13,000 iffy jobs. But um, how far along in the process are we? Is the state of Wisconsin stuck with this? Or, you know, is can we as citizens do anything? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll yeah. turn that right over to you guys. Well, certainly it's not done yet. It did pass the assembly, but again, it just went through joint finance. It has to go through the Senate yet. So I would say certainly still stay in contact with your representatives, with your senators, with the governor's office. Let them know how you feel. I know I personally, I do have petitions with me for anybody who would want to sign against it. There are online petitions you can sign, even if you're for it. Contact your legislator and let them know because it isn't done. Um, and even if it passes, if people stay in touch with their legislators, perhaps there's possibilities to get changes to some of these concerns about it. So I would say it's not completely done yet, so stay in touch with your legislators. I think, and I think, um, I'll get back to the, what I started with, is the, the speed at which it's moving, um, you know, and of course the politics involved in everything sometimes makes it hard to keep a clear head, but each day that this goes on, there's new questions raised, and even though it might be some of the bigger things that aren't getting addressed that I have concerns with, um, I know at the hearing the other day there were little things raised that I think the Senate is going to change the bill, which means we'll have to vote on it in the Assembly again. Um, you know, some of our questions are that it couldn't be asked. The company is expected that they're going to bring a, you know, a fairly considerable number of foreign workers over to work in this company. It's a, it, you know, they'll, my question was, will they get the tax credits, um, you know, that the state is buying? And, yeah. and they couldn't answer it, but I, I think they said, you know, I think, I think so. Um, no. Of course, they also said that they've had, you know, that, because they, you know, beginning next year, a thousand people are already supposed to be working there. Right. And when we raised this, what are these, we said, well, what are these jobs? They said, we've already had more than 500 hotel nights in Wisconsin from Foxconn employees, to which I said, well, are those people, you know, the lawyers that are here getting the tax credits counting as employees? I, you know. Yeah. And they couldn't answer that. Not, not very well. So let's, let's, for just a second here, I want to take that. You said a thousand employees in that first year, and and Foxconn has said they plan to bring people from foreign countries in to fill some of these jobs. It's yeah, you know, it's anticipated, you know, not of the one thousand forty. Okay. I, I think that um, look, they're a global company yeah. who does. You know, and I'm not even saying like, oh, don't don't bring no, those no, people no. over. I'm saying. You know, it's anticipated as a per, you know, part of that workforce, right. especially given our shortage. Right. Um, they're, you know, I'm saying it's likely that they'll bring people from other uh, yeah. uh, other factories and other places. Sure. You know, for a while, maybe permanently. Yeah. There has been some concern about what kind of H-1Bs are going to be yep. pushed for, uh, especially Those if worker twenty visas. bucks an hour doesn't doesn't get people in right. or. But so if that, if, so let's just say somebody came from China and took one of these jobs, and they work here for a year. They would be working and living in Wisconsin. Why wouldn't they pay income tax on that? Wouldn't they? No, I mean that's what I mean. No, I, I mean I, that's what I'm saying. I mean, and I'm and a little bit. Do think they wouldn't? Why wouldn't they pay income tax? I mean, well, I would say they works. would, but again, by their own analysis, even what they're counting for employees spending here and accounting for their spending here and their taxes are paying. Again, the total is still 181 million a year when we're paying 200, 250 million a year. Right. In my thing, I have a different take. Some, some of my colleagues. I, I look. I wish all of the jobs were filled by Wisconsin people. Right. But I also would be more than happy if thirteen thousand thirty-year-olds moved to Wisconsin from right. all over the country to, to buy houses well, and live here well, and take. Let's these just jobs. take one person from Illinois. If they work in Wisconsin, do they not pay income taxes to Wisconsin? They do. They do. So whether they work, live here or not, if they work here, they are generating tax revenue for our state. Yes. Right. Okay. So just putting that out there. Yep. No, and it's one of the things that now they will pay property taxes, right. sales taxes, yep. and other things. One of the things we saw yesterday was some of the uh, northern counties in Illinois uh, that have suppliers are organizing to make a pretty concerted effort to get some of that indirect business right. and jobs that are probably included in the uh, you know analysis. Baker Tilly analysis. Yep. You know, and I don't know what that we can do about it. Some of the critics right. of states playing against each other suggested that you know the optimal scenario would have been Indiana, Illinois, and right. Wisconsin, and Michigan maybe getting together, shipping in together, and building a regional thing. Obviously, that's in Europe, 
that's kind of they're not yeah. allowed to pay, play against each other. Right, right. That's the EU prohibits member states from competing against each other to take jobs from each other. Amanda, your point is even when we account for all of these income tax revenues and sales tax revenues and property tax revenues going to local governments, all of that in is still less than what we would be paying them potentially in any given year while the incentives are being paid out. Yeah, and that's just according to the, their right. own Ernst & Young study. Right. Uh, but I do want to talk, since we're talking about the jobs yeah. and talking about who qualifies for these credits, I do want to point out, so WEDEC would be in charge of this and verifying the jobs. But according to audit reports of WEDEC, they have no process for verifying these jobs and never have verified any of these jobs for any of the credits that they've ever done. And in fact, the uh, audit report actually said in some cases they went back and changed the contract so the company could keep their full amount, of, I think it was like $14 million in this case, so they could keep all of it without having to get any back, without actually having to create the jobs they were supposed to in the first place. They just lowered the number and said, we're good, you get to keep the money. And where did you hear that? That was in the audit report. Okay. So that, ju that just was released not too long ago. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, so there are concerns. We actually tried to put forward an amendment with an actual process for WEDEC so they could verify these jobs using payroll against unemployment claims, and that failed. So, so we couldn't even get that basic accountability. That's really interesting that you say that you offered an amendment to try and bolster the process at the state's economic development organization in order to have faith that they could actually carry out the powers that they would be given in this bill. Yeah. Uh, when I got to talk with Governor Walker the day after he was at the White House, I asked about this specifically. In my background, I've worked with businesses in this area who are trying to leverage state incentives that are available to them. And for, first, I'll tell you, the process is a nightmare. And uh, so that could always be improved. And I'm sure you've heard that from business owners as well. Um, but when I asked him specifically about their ability to verify the jobs that are created and any potential clawbacks that would have to be done, that would be taking the incentive back if once it is paid, the job that triggered it is destroyed. Um, and I asked specifically about WEDEC. What he told me was the nature of this package and project would be so high profile that he was certain that the legislature would create a standalone committee just to do oversight of this project. And it sounds like you were trying to do just that in the process of passing this bill. And um, I'm assuming it's the Republican majority did not vote for this. Yeah, I mean, I would say the amendment didn't say anything about creating a committee. It just okay. created a very specific process for WEDEC to okay. use to verify okay. jobs. I mean, certainly a committee could work, but I don't understand why a simple process yeah. for WEDEC to use, right. and not just in this case, but for WEDEC to use in other cases that they don't have a process for failed on party lines. Right. Is there a, is there a, I'm sorry, is there a committee in the legislature currently who has oversight that they would be able to hold hearings and try and hold WEDIC accountable on this if, assuming this passes, if this gets going, is there a committee that has that authority? It's not a specific committee, but joint finance yeah, maybe? Uh, yeah, a lot of times, uh, you know, for, you know, you could put language in there that would say, uh, you know, subject to, uh, payment or something maybe you could put in that they've been very concerned about not you know the reason they rejected a command of, you know of the yeah. amendments um, and even some of our suggestions is you know it's what makes me nervous is you know they they um, you know they didn't seem to want to they're saying well you guys pass the bill and don't worry we'll put a lot of these things in the contract well it's hard for me to pass a you know sign on to a, a, a bill until I know and as Amanda said Weedix track record on the incentives that we already have is not that good. Um, and, and I like Mark Hogan a lot. I've talked to him quite a bit. Um, some of it is it's just really hard. You know, some of it is, you know, we've done audits of Weedix and it's just been, you know, just haven't done a very good job. Um, in the state of Washington, they gave eight and a half billion dollars to Boeing uh, a couple of years ago. And they are trying desperately. Now, they had some clawback provisions in there, and they've uh, gotten rid of 13,000 workers, and the state now, Republicans and Democrats, are trying to pass new legislation to go after money that they never received back, because, you know, the, the, that investment obviously was included some conditions on jobs, so that makes me a little you know, scared. They obviously don't want to be so prescriptive with the legislation that makes it difficult to have the contract, but it's hard for me to say, you know, they're saying, trust us. I mean, think about the case we just had. Let's say a foreign worker comes over for a year and they get that credit, but then either that job leaves and is not replaced by somebody else, does that count as one of the 13,000 know, jobs or... I don't know, because I haven't thought about, you know, 
know, if the job leaves and it's done and it's replaced right. by a robot, right. you know what I mean? So I mean, we, if they do go forward with this, and I have no idea if, even if it passes, if it's going to happen or not, um, you know, these are things, I mean, what if someone works for five years? You know, what's the, I mean, I think that the worst case scenario is that they use all of the capital credits, right. and then we have an obsolete factory. Because the only, one, you know, one thing that we haven't said is, I've seen a lot of articles talking about this being uh, Google or Intel or Microsoft. Foxconn is a contractor. They build things for those companies. Apple pays Foxconn to create the iPhone. They don't create products. There right. isn't, you know, if you're wondering like, oh, check out the new Foxconn iPhone. Right. It's not. They make the iPhone for Apple. They're a contractor. They, they you know, they're an assembly, you know, and so, so they are now getting into the LCD market, but there's not exactly a track record of success. And they would be creating these LCDs to then have Sony sell and put their name on, or, or some no, other. No, no, I think this is their they're first actually going venture. To be they bought. They bought Sharp. Oh, that's it. Okay. All right. So. Okay. So they're actually going to have their own product on that's the right. for and, the first so time. So this is you know new, and I you know they're yeah. going to invest in uh, R and D, and I know Michigan is looking at getting their. Yeah. Uh, research and development, you know, place. Right. If again any of this happens. So when there was a Janesville plant in Beloit, there were also a lot of supplier firms that were in Beloit. Now when Janesville went away, or I'm sorry, from Janesville, when uh, GM went away from Janesville, those suppliers mostly left as well. So in as much as there is this huge upside potential of the downstream benefits to existing businesses, there's also that risk that if the, the the sun goes away, then then everything withers around it. If Foxconn were not to stick around long term, those suppliers, uh, those existing businesses, could end up uh, holding the bag or being overinvested and overextended as well. There's that downside risk, and that's one of the concerns. Yeah, I mean, I've been reading a lot about supply chains, and it's really interesting. And you know, I, I represent Oshkosh, and so I'm more familiar with Oshkosh Truck and a lot of the businesses that we have that supply Oshkosh Truck that exist primarily because of them. Um, same with Mercury. Um, the one thing I've sort of learned is you can't just create a supply chain. You know, you can't say, well, we're going to open a business and then we're going to have other um, other you know businesses come up and, and uh, they're going to become the suppliers. With the iPhone, uh, you know, the supply chain was in China, but the, the people that make the little things that go in the iPhone are getting paid wages that will never exist, that we, we would never work for right, here. Right. And so some of the components of this LCD screen just simply won't be made here because we would they would never be cost effective. And cost competitive, yeah. Yeah, and again, they're building the plant, you know, it's sort of like we don't, the foreign companies that make refrigerators, I don't think they make them in, uh, you know, in, in Japan, they make them here with the Japanese company because you don't want to ship those. Right. Um, I think they're thinking the same thing of having a, a domestic uh, factory here, but a lot of the other components besides the actual screen are probably going to be imported and they may not, you know, these screens might not even be sourced here. Yeah. Again, we don't know exactly what that's going to look like from them. And there is efforts underway by the state chamber and other business organizations to try and establish that supply chain, identify potential existing businesses in Wisconsin who could supply anything or everything that Foxconn would need, but we do not, we do not know yet what that would look like. Other questions or concerns anybody wants to get in with? I got one. Guy. Yeah. Uh, a statement to the question. I'm a small businessman, obviously. I started an organic lawn care company nine years ago. The struggles that I went through to do that, the licensing, you know, the, the hiring, the, the, the taxes, everything, I've had to undergo. It was, we almost quit two or three times. When I when we were three years old, we got a $9,000 fine from the Department of Agriculture because we sprayed three houses weeds with vinegar and water. And nine thousand dollar fine almost put our company under because we're mom and pop, literally mom and pop, we're working on that company. Um, so that is a as a small businessman who's turning around through a lot of hard work on my wife and my part, and obviously my kids' part. And you know, we're still around for nine years. So now I'm looking into this, and you and I talk almost daily. It seems yep. like about this, and this is why I wanted to do this. One of the questions that I had for John, for uh, Gordon. When he, when he took your place, which excellent taking your place, Monday, and we'll watch out for your job now. <laughs> Although Dean would not agree with you. I know Dean And a question that I, I just wanted to ask again so that you can get the answer. Uh, Wisconsin ranked 33 in job production between the years 2015 and 2016. Organically, at that time, 33 was a terrible number. 
Well, we did create 37,000 jobs, and I'm assuming we're creating more than that right now organically. Why do we need to pay a company when we're creating these jobs on our own, where the money goes to companies like mine, people that stays here in the country, which the profits aren't going overseas? Why do we need this? Uh, the question is why, you know, we have relatively low unemployment. Uh, we've had modest job growth, about a little more than half of the national um, rate. And I, you know, some of it has been a uh, slow economy in Wisconsin. Some of it has been, like I said, a shortage of uh, workers. Um, you know, I think the hopes of people uh, are that the injection of this kind of new economy business will create better paying jobs. Um, you know, like the younger guy said before, we'll, we'll make people want to stay here, we'll recruit people from out of state. I mean, a lot of hopes and aspirational stuff. Um, you know, a lot of us also, yes, yeah, so reminding Amanda earlier of a quote, you know, about sort of organic. I mean, I always bring up Epic Systems in Madison. This was a small business. It was built off of the talent that existed, right? Yep. That grew, that got a niche, that probably got lucky at a couple times, but was near the UW Madison. They got incentives to build a big plant that paid for themselves over in Verona. They are, I don't know, 10,000 people or whatever they employ. Um, you know, that's an organic story, and we've got plenty of those in Wisconsin. Um, and I think you raise a really good question. I mean, you can say, well, with Mercury and Oshkosh Corp, I mean, those were long standing you know, existing businesses. And, mentioned to you all the suppliers that already existed that we weren't hoping that would start that you could say well priming the pump during the recession at a time when they needed to expand or we wanted to retain them made some sense um, there are you know there are some libertarian groups who suggest you know we should lower the taxes of everybody instead of giving it all to one company or that government shouldn't be in the business of this anyway but uh, you know my three pillars are always uh, you know, infrastructure, you know, invest in roads and bridges and um, invest in education, human infrastructure, and then support entrepreneurship. I mean, uh, quality of life, make this a place people want to live, and people want to work here, people live here, and businesses want to come here, then, you know, that'll grow from there. So I think you make a good point. And I think it comes down to if we really want to help our economy, what's a better way to use $3 billion, or what's a better investment or a better way to help our economy? And quite frankly, a lot of the things we do in Wisconsin help big business versus little business. I mean, even, I'm sure Gordon probably has the number memorized about the manufacturing and egg tax credit. The majority of it went to what the top, was it seven? Wealthiest people in Wisconsin. Um, so the truth is a lot of what we do is an aimed at really helping the people who would benefit most, which are the small businesses. And again, they don't pick up and leave. They're invested in their community. They're invested in their employees. And so we're better off looking at how we can help those folks rather than using these big incentives. But now, is there a way to calculate the payback on an investment like that? If we were going to invest, let's just say $1 billion into supporting existing small businesses, is there any way to know when we would get a return on that investment? I mean, that's the problem that we have when we talk about, you know, same with social policy. We can right. say for every dollar we put into this, you know, it'll pay for itself. And, and there's legitimate numbers that can quantify that, but the public has a hard time seeing it. If I say 13,000 jobs, $10 billion, right. and there's ever a shovel in the ground, people will see that. It sounds tangible. That's why it's very effective as a political line and why you got to be um, smarter about it. I think you can. Um, you know, quantify those things and, uh, you know, and you should. And again, you know, our job is to uh, take good information and make the best decision that we can. And I think there is a strong argument on, and Amanda said it perfectly, I mean, we should always, I mean, in the budget, I said it yesterday, you know, what is the best use of the limited tax dollars we have if the goal is enhancing the opportunity of the citizens that live in this state? Now, you know, this is a pretty risky, big gamble, but you know, I think their, their intent is, is good. You know, I mean, I think they want to get good paying jobs and spur some new growth in an area that has, has struggled since manufacturing decline, but it, it does come at the expense of a lot of other things. Other co comments? Yep. Um, I'd just like to build on that. Other Why should we be concerned? What is the downside 
what are we sacrificing for that two hundred million dollars potentially the check we're going to write from our state? That's take a great your, question. Take your favorite government program. I mean, the one thing that I've been saying is. Um, you know, I mentioned before, you know, our revenue growth hasn't been great, but it's been going up for one of the longest periods in U.S. history. Um, and so we really haven't had, a, you know, down, we've had money, but we still haven't been making a lot of investments in things like the UW system. One of the challenges we're going to have going forward, in 10 years we will have more retirees than workers. And there are more government services, especially in Medicaid, for frail elderly, developmentally disabled, nursing homes. Our expenses are going to go up to take care of an elderly population who is not working and is uh, the revenue we generate from Social Security and pension income is lower. So we will have less money to take care of more people with expensive services, meaning if we, do, if we don't do Foxconn, we will have less money for um, education and the UW system. Um, but if we do do Foxconn, because there's a period of time from like 2022 to 2026, if the best case scenario works out, meaning a pretty aggressive buildup, right. that it is going to cost us $400 million of budget. That is 60 some percent of the amount of money that Governor Walker is talking about putting into education this year. Just so you, you know, so you can imagine. And that's, you know, think about if we're in a recession at the wrong time. So that's the best case scenario. What's the worst case scenario? <laughs> You're right, because that is the net number. So that number assumes that we are giving away the credit, but we are also getting the maximum right. income generated from uh, the jobs that are all there. You know, under the scenario I gave you before, where they get the credit for building it, but they only have 3,000 employees, the payoff is later and probably more expensive during those years. Again, it's hard to tell someone like, Foxconn, it could be a disaster in 2023. Yeah. Yeah. But that's... Yeah. But I think, to your point, the worst case scenario would be a situation where vital government services don't have the funding they need. At least our current governor has set a red line on the budget that no new tax increases would be in any budget he would sign. Uh, is that right? Except for uh, Priuses, electric vehicles. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Electric vehicles are going to have a $100 fee on them now. Um, so, Gordon, as far as working this into the budget, the Foxconn incentive deal has gone and had a hearing at Joint Finance. Did Joint Finance vote on the bill? No, and this is going to be interesting because if everything the governor says is going to happen, 1,000 workers next year, 10,000 construction jobs to build a factory 11 times the size of Lambeau Field, right? In the next budget, meaning the one we're in now, 1719, we actually have a more revenue generated than we do have expense. My question is, are they going to build that into this budget? And if they don't, what are they saying? The project's not going to happen, right? So I asked that the other day, and you know, we're meeting on Monday and we're meeting on the Tuesday after Labor Day, and I think they said we're going to vote on the budget September 12th in the assembly, maybe. It's my anniversary. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, yeah, it's well. But uh, so you know, and I think the Foxconn vote depends on what the Senate does, and you know, but I mean, it, it impacts this budget. So you would think they would have to do something, right? So the Foxconn incentive bill. I mean, I've heard. Uh, I think it was Senator Roger Roth say he thinks that the budget and the Foxconn deal can get delivered to the governor's desk like basically simultaneously. Doesn't the Foxconn bill have to be inside the budget? Doesn't the budget have to account for? The Foxconn bill? I think so. Is, it, is there any way to pass a budget that doesn't account for the Foxconn bill? I mean, they could, right? They could just sign it. Could, but then you have to figure out where the money's coming right. from. Right. Okay. Okay. This. I mean, because these are questions I've had for weeks. I mean, there is some. There's some. There, there are more. There's more revenue again under. If you think that Favorable there will be, if you think there will be ten thousand people working on a construction project in southeastern Wisconsin next March. Um, so. Okay. All right. Um, any specific questions here? I've got one about TIFF, and this actually came from a listener of mine. On Monday, while Gordon was hosting my show, <laughs> it came to me, and I wasn't there, so I couldn't ask it. Um, so I'll ask it now. Um, this listener is particularly interested in tax increment financing, and part of the assembly amendment 
adds to the list of municipal services that can be funded using tax increment revenue. So right now that includes things like infrastructure or incentives for the specific business. There's a, a short list of things that that money can be spent on. This adds to the list and includes operating expenses for things like public safety. So their question is, would that change apply to all of Wisconsin or just to this project? Do you have any? Just so um, it would just impact, this is like a special Okay, mega a special tip. exception. But the other thing is, um, this is what I was getting at before. So you, you create this district and then you make this massive investment and the value that is added to the property is used to pay off whatever, you know, uh, water, sewer, right. streets, right. roads, construction. But obviously, if you have 35,000 people move to southeastern Wisconsin, this is one of the problems I have is, yes, there's revenue generated, but there's also expenses generated. You have more people in your schools, you have more housing, you have more you know, needs. The way they wrote that amendment is money can be taken from the TIF to pay for those additional services related to the new project being there. So that's where, you know, okay. and okay, so local government could be creative about yeah. how they report that, but it is not going to, you know, they all have a decision to make if they want to increase everybody else's property taxes up to the new value for 30 years or wait, you know, uh, not get that windfall 30 years later. So, I mean, I think the, I'm waiting, you know, I guess the local governments are putting in their offers, like you said, maybe someone already knows where it's going to go. I don't know, but, in all of these assessments and analysis on cost, none of them take into consideration what the increased cost and impact of 35,000 people, uh, assuming there's going to be trucks and other things delivering additional housing need. Um, you know, there are you know, yeah. 80% you know, of new job growth uh, increases expenses. Yeah. And we did hear from the municipalities in the assembly hearing saying we need to, we'll have to raise taxes. There's no way around it. We'll have to raise taxes to pay for some of these things. And Gordon was kind of talking about the TIF earlier, but about how in the areas they were talking about, like Kenosha and Racine, their total tax base is what fourteen billion dollars. As you have a ten billion dollar project coming in, potentially you could raise taxes by seventy percent if the if if the local government wanted to take all they could before it expires and they can't take anything. So there are huge increases. And when we talk about clawbacks, there's no clawbacks for the local money being right. spent. There's no way for them to get that back. Yeah. Well, and once you build a road, there's no clawing back a road, right? Once you put infrastructure in the ground for a project, that money is spent. That's a sunk cost, quite literally. Um, and so, yeah, they're, they're, that money can't be spent elsewhere. Any other questions or concerns? Anybody want to voice? Yeah. Yeah, this has gone <clears throat> through the assembly already, but we're not getting much news on what the sentiment is in the state senate. Are there the votes there? Is this train left the station? Or you know, are we wasting our time here? Good question. I think there's uh, there might be some more caution in the senate. Some of the w members who I thought would be more uh, difficult to get around, people that actually say they believe in the free market, um, seem to come out and support early. Uh, so that made me feel like maybe there wasn't opposition, but uh, we had questions come up this week that makes me think they're at least going to make some minor changes to try to improve the accountability of it. Um, you know, there's been some polling done around the state that was shared that showed in, in some of the senators' districts uh, it's not that popular. I think there is a difference between the southeastern Wisconsin, uh, you know, more excitement than in the rest of the state. Um, you know, and so I, I, I pretty confident it's gonna go. But you're also seeing a pretty. You, you saw the Gannett paper today. There was a big article on uh, the, the chambers and all the business groups that are organizing. I know that they're really squeezing the UW system uh, to try to push. You know, come out in support of making the Senate go, um, even though I don't think they're really that excited about the project. Public statement from Senate Majority Leader Scott Fitzgerald was he didn't know if he had the votes. And that was two weeks ago. Well, and I know Roger Roth had made some initial comments about not being in a rush, right. about taking time. Right. I know some of those have kind of changed recently, those comments, yeah. but I think initially there was some, some pause there. Yeah. Well, uh, State Senator Roger Roth will be my guest on Fresh Take at 10 o'clock on Monday. So uh, I'll be asking him that, as well as other questions we've heard here today. Um, so if you want to tune in uh, a little after 10 on AM 1150 WHBY or 103.5 FM here in the Valley. Uh, you can hear from Senator Roth and uh, you can call in actually and ask him any questions you have 
yourself. He is the Senate president. He has a considerable influence over how this is going to go um, and the pace at which it will move. Um, with the, about half an hour we have left, I kind of want to elevate this conversation beyond the specifics of this Foxconn deal to a larger conversation around business incentives. Um, this is a big question, is what is appropriate for government to lay as a condition on a business? Now, if you're handing them a bunch of money, that may be different. Right, so define it as you will, but what kind of conditions do you think are appropriate for government to place on business in something like this, where incentives are being offered? What kind of conditions would you be comfortable placing on them? Well, I think it's fair to ask for good wages. I think it's fair to ask that they are respectful of the environment. I mean, I do think business has a responsibility to the community. You know, I was talking to my uncle who's 85 years old and worked for a paper company for most of his life, and he talked about how he was in charge of testing the water quality and how they knew they were dumping things in the water that shouldn't be there and the head of this company knew that well we could probably get away with it right but it's not the right thing to do and so they took the initiative to build some ponds and stuff to put this in and, and he was saying his biggest concern about this is the exemptions to the environmental permitting because as he sees it that companies do have a responsibility and they should do the right thing they shouldn't just try and get away with stuff because they can um, but they have responsibility to the communities that they're in. So I don't think it's unfair to ask that they, they pay their fair share in taxes, that they pay their employees well and treat them well and provide them benefits and take care of our environment. Because in the long run, that actually does pay off. It pays off for the company to be able to get employees. It pays off for the community. Um, so I don't think it's unfair to ask for some basic requirements like that. Um, I, I, you know, I echo a lot of those things. I, I, I'm more... You know, I mentioned earlier that if we're going to give money to a, a company, you know, I would have liked to have seen it more of the money going to customized job training um, that benefits the company and the worker. Um, I, I, you know, I, I do think, look, we do do a lot. The reason we have infrastructure isn't just for the movement of people, it's for the movement of goods. Um, you know, the educated workforce that gets hired by somebody could be looked at as taxpayer supported for businesses that allows them to be uh, productive and uh, and have a, have a profit. Um, I guess one of the things I think that offends a lot of people is, you know, if you want to do business in Wisconsin, um, you know, do it by the same rules that we ask everybody else, uh, whether that's the environmental standards um, and uh, you know, obviously our, our labor standards um, as well. I do think that if you are going to take taxpayer money, there probably should be more accountability involved. Uh, and that's not, I guess, that's one of the red flags that we're seeing here, although they're saying, let us do that in the contract, don't put it in the bill. You know, maybe I can understand that the, uh, um, you don't want to, you want to give them that flexibility. In negotiating, yeah. So, you know, I think you talk about some basic standards you'd like to see in, in a package like this, uh, some wage floors and uh, just some expectation about what's going to come in exchange for what they're going to get. Uh, Gordon, you talk about just, you know, play by the rules that exist for everyone else. Those rules have gotten us bottom half of the country job creation and seller dweller status in new job startups. Is there reason to believe that what have, we've had for so long needs to change? Uh, other states compete fiercely for flagship pro uh, projects like this. Um, the uplands of South Carolina has been remade by a BMW plant that came a decade ago. Isn't there that potential here, and should Wisconsin be more aggressive in competing for those kind of projects in order to improve our talent retention, income numbers, property values, things like that? Do we need to be more aggressive? I mean, there are a lot of, I mean, every economist will tell you that the factors that go into economic development include everything from an educated workforce, yep. good infrastructure, tax climate, yep. um, regulatory things. I mean, you know, one side likes to overemphasize some of those issues, the other side likes to overemphasize, you know, the other ones. Right. It's really a combination of these things. You know, uh, the difference between the Twin Cities and Milwaukee is the Twin Cities had some emerging new businesses like 3M that Milwaukee didn't have as an industrial city. Um, that's one of the biggest differences between Minnesota and uh, Wisconsin is the, you know, mega effect of the Twin Cities economic influence there versus the old industry. Um, that exists, you know, in much of Wisconsin. So you can't look at where you are now without looking at where you were, um, you know, over the last 50 years. Uh, you know, we say 
oh, our regulatory climate's horrible, but we also say if you don't have a clean environment and quality state parks and other things, people aren't going to want to live here. So I guess there's trade-offs with all those things. You know, I asked on your show the other day, Josh, when I was hosting on Fresh Take, <laughs> I asked uh, Greg Leroy, uh, who is the executive director of uh, Good Jobs First, you know, has there ever been a one of these incentive packages that worked, or what's the best one? And I think he mentioned a auto plant in Kentucky, and it may have been a little, you know, with auto plants, especially maybe 20, 30 years ago, you could see 30 years out and know with some certainty with a brand that worked, that was produced there, that you would have the ripple effect and, and that would work. We, we've seen states, though, I mentioned Boeing and Washington. If you remember, North Carolina gave away the farm to secure a Dell facility. They were gone in two years. You know, they got tens of millions of dollars. Um, so, I mean, if, if your economic development, you know, what's the quote? You can't buy sustainable economic development. You can't buy a supply chain for a business. You know, there's so many things about this deal. Something could happen and something positive could happen, and I hope it really does. But there's a lot of things that people are talking about that don't make, don't, it's not how it actually happens. Well, I would just say, I don't think it's about paying companies like this, that it's really about, you know, listening to the stories like we heard from, from a small business owner just trying to make it and getting $9,000 fines, like looking, from that perspective, how can we as a state not get rid of permits, not get rid of regulations, but be a partner with small businesses rather than an adversary all the time so that we can keep those standards, keep those permits and things that we need to get the quality of life we want without putting a burden on small businesses that are just trying to make it, who are trying to play by the rules but don't always know or don't have the resources to comply. So how do we keep the standards and be more of a partner so it's not so hard to be a startup, not so hard to run a small business? Is there some prospect for making progress on that? I mean, how, how do you go about doing that, right? That we, we, can, uh, we can point out the concerns of go, putting a bunch of eggs in one basket with one big project without pros promise of results. How would we go about making this state better for the businesses that are here and for those we would like to see start and grow here? Is there some prospect for that? Well, I mean, there is the red tape review yep. that the Republicans have going on. Now, I would say they're using that to actually more so get rid of regulations they don't like rather than trying to streamline it. But I do think going through and looking at things like that is not a bad idea to figure out where are ways we can be more efficient or help small businesses. I also think it's looking at like the DNR. So the DNR is a common complaint, right? About how it takes so long to get permits. And it's true, sometimes you hear that it takes years to get a permit and that is unacceptable. But I don't think the answer is get rid of permits then, but look at what do we need to do? Increase staff, increase the process. What is it we need to do to move it along faster rather than just get rid of it? So Wisconsin was not the only state competing for this Foxconn plant. There were, as I have read, seven states that were competing and one of them is Illinois. We were the one that was chosen. So maybe it's all of these wonderful things you've talked about that have actually brought us this, but putting an incentive package on the table was part of the ante. That was part of the buy-in to get into the conversation, to even be considered. So if we're not even entering the funnel, we can't come out the end the winner. Don't we need to be actively engaged in this process of courting companies or else won't we see them go to other states and will end up remaining in the bottom of job creation and economic development uh, in the country? But don't we need to be engaged in that? If your best economic development strategy is to pay a company that would never otherwise end up in your state, um, I don't know that that's the best way to do it. I mean, okay. again, I can only go with labor economists will tell you that it's better to support industry and grow within your own state than it is to try to buy off a business to come. I mean, most of the national analysis said southeastern Wisconsin, with the exception of water, is one of the worst locations for this company to locate in the country. Um, if you remember, you know, after the election, Trump said we are going to put a border tax on the uh, companies who export their jobs and bring them back into the country. Um, Foxconn said they were going to locate a company here. Uh, all swing states were considered. I, you know, you had it in Paul Ryan's district with Donald Trump. Yeah. And the day after they had the announcement, Paul Ryan and Donald Trump announced they were dropping the border tax from consideration in their tax reform plan. Now, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that's cynical. That's how these things work. Paul Ryan's speaker, he should get it in his district. That's a little bit of how it how it goes. 
but it doesn't make me feel good about the fact with the you know the access to Lake Michigan water is clearly um, an important part of the water intensive LCD screen uh, manufacturing process. Um, I do think being close to the Chicago Milwaukee markets could be could be. Although it's funny, they're saying if only we had rail. If only. Well, I would say Foxconn themselves laid out seven reasons besides us that they were already looking here, which is why I don't think we really need to pay them this amount of money. And also, if you're in the game, but you're paying more than what you're getting back, you're not winning at that game. And if we look at like Michigan, their Foxconn plant, I think they're only paying like 250 million or something like that total. So if they can only pay 250 million and get them, why do we have to pay 3 billion? You know, and we asked about what were some of the other deals offered by the other states, and they wouldn't give us that information. So we don't really know how competitive this process was. And let's be clear, there are other things in this bill. You know, you mentioned some money for another company. There's also money in there for a company called Pfizer. So they can get, I think it's $2 million from the state to lay off 7% of their workforce. Can you give us some details on that? What are you talking about? Um, so that's a company that is in Brookfield, and... They said they were looking at moving, so this says that they can get $2 million to stay in the state, and they only have to retain 93% of their workforce. So again, they're getting $2 million to essentially lay off 7% of their workforce. They could it's, lay off It's, gotten, of it's gotten no attention yeah. because I think it's actually like up to $10 million, isn't it? Or is it? I thought it was like $2 million, but... Well, it's not the but this has been <laughs> slipped into the Foxconn bill. Yeah, and it even says right in the analysis, this has nothing to do with Foxconn. And so this is what starts to happen now, and everybody says, well, I want some couple million dollars too where I'm going to go. And right. I asked, what's the definition of going through a competitive bidding process? They couldn't give me one. There's no definition of what that means. So they can say, we're just going to go, and that can be considered their competitive bidding process. They don't have to prove that it would be cheaper for them somewhere else, or that they'd be better off financially to move somewhere else. They can just say it and get money from the state. Other concerns? I hate to dominate this, but um, You're not. I got one of the big questions I have, obviously, with the speed of how they're trying to push this through, and just kind of goes to Amanda. You know, they're pushing this through so fast. Why not a referendum? Obviously, there's people like us here and more people all across the state who have questions, and this is thrown so far and so fast at us. Why not a referendum? Right? Is there any way we can get into the point of a referendum? I mean, I think that's a good question, considering each and every single man, woman, and child will be paying about $519, about $1,200 a household this comes out to. Um, I don't know if it's ever been done on a referendum for a tax incentive package, and as we talked about earlier, I mean, I suppose like it's tricky about so everything WEDEC does, should that be a referendum? But you know, I think it's a good question. If we're all paying for it, should we get a chance to vote on it and say whether or not we want to pay that money for this company? So, I mean, I think there's always potential where you could pass it to say it has to go through referendum. I don't think it's likely, though. Just to have a referendum, I mean, basically we get to learn a little bit more so that we know where our dollars go. I know, I don't, yeah, I, I base a lot of my purchasing on commercials. So when I go into Festival Foods, I know what I'm going to buy already because I've heard about it and had a chance to sample it. Yep. Uh, like here. Uh, but you know, that, and that's, that, that's here for me. And then all of a sudden somebody says, hey, we're going to take There's nothing that says they have to stay here after they get the money. That's why they'll have all the money after 15 years, but we don't see any return under best case scenario for 25. And that, I mean, that's why, that's why some of us voted against it, right? I mean, those are our concerns and about why we just can't support it right now. I mean, in, in saying that, I mean, trying to determine what exactly is going to happen, I understand the argument that, well, no one's going to invest $10 billion and then just walk away from it. You know, but the market could change, and I guess that is, you know, when I was at the hearing, I asked, does anybody know if we'll still be making large LCD screens in six years? You know, and I've been reading more about this. I mean, there already is, you know, technology where you can kind of throw these roll-out flat screens. It's just that the pixels aren't as, they don't have it down yet. 
but if they do get it down, it will replace the LCD screens. And I don't know how fast these things are ultimately, um, you know, moving. I mean, on the referendum, the question was about, you know, is there any way to get, you know, concern about the speed that this is moving to get more input or get referendum from people on something as complex as this? Uh, I mean, I, I don't know that I've had a bigger issue that has um, more consequences, more unknowns that you ultimately have to make a decision on. And I'm not saying to drag it out for six months, but uh, I do think it is very hard when your questions about accountability and uh, what guarantees we have, you know, we're told, well, we're going to work that into the contract. It won't be in the bill, but it'll be in the contract. And, and I think that's really, you know, makes it hard for us to be uh, more supportive, of even if we are, uh, we're okay with the with the financial cost of the best case scenario. Yeah, yeah. Now, there's the potential you're talking about that five years, six years after this plant is complete, flat screens become obsolete, and this whole thing kind of goes kaput and we've paid out some X millions of dollars in incentives, we've received some level of return, but more out than in, and so we end up net losing on this. There's also a scenario where this becomes the hub of a gigantic tech industry in the Midwest. Now, we don't know the likelihood of any of those scenarios, but either of those could happen. It's that uncertainty that is the main concern, and I think that's where, at least from my perspective, again, I don't have a horse in this fight. From the day this was announced, I've said I'm, I'm in the skeptical optimist camp. I'd like it to work. I hope it would work. I'm skeptical it will work. But I, that's where we get these questions from. And so as a skeptical optimist, my question is, okay, our economy in Wisconsin is not as good as many other states, right? Now we can, we can argue about why that's the case, but what are we going to do about it? And a referendum puts some, some power in the hands of the people as far as should this happen. I'm curious, just quick show of hands, how many of you think this should go to referendum in the state of Wisconsin? You think this should be a referendum vote? Okay, you are engaged people, right? You bothered to show up on a Friday night to learn about a bill in the legislature. <laughs> I suspect you'd do your homework, you'd show up, you'd do that vote. I suspect the lion's share of people wouldn't bother to vote. And I'm curious how much you'd be willing to let your government of your money spend to advertise in that referendum. Because you know they're going to promote it, right? Of course they're going to promote it. So how much would you be willing to spend in order to have the right to vote on this? And then it could still go down, right? So I'm just trying to, I'm playing devil's advocate on this. There are costs to all of these things. There is no guarantee on any of it. And so I don't want to leave us here. We have 15 minutes. I don't want to leave this sort of like in the giant mystery on we, we don't know, but we don't know. And there's a lot still to be determined. And that's where I think, Gordon, your point about the pace of this is the big concern. And I'm going to be interested to hear what Senator Roth has to say on Monday about just how fast they see this moving once it gets to the Senate, because it could change considerably. When it comes back to the assembly, the assembly will have to vote again. There may be things in there that assembly Republican leaders don't like. We've seen historic rates of infighting among Republican leaders in the legislature. The last time there was one party control of the legislature and they didn't have a budget done on time was like, uh, I don't know, like uh, in, the, in the FDR administration or something. It was decades and decades ago. None of us were alive when it happened. And so there is no guarantee that just because it passed quickly through the assembly, it will do so in the Senate. Uh, but we are hearing positive things. If it were to come back to the assembly, any sense that you two have, you're both members of the assembly, um, any sense of what it would take to derail this in the assembly? What would it take to get those advocates who've been pushing this for a month now off of this train? Anything you could imagine that the Senate would do that would stop this in the assembly? I wish I could tell you that every single thing we did was just based on pure public policy grounds <laughs> in the best interest of the state. and. You know, Josh shouted me down for maybe some of my criticisms of past decisions by the governor, but you I was know, just to keep it relevant. I, I realize that. But part of this is this is the governor doubling down on this is what you're going to hear about between now and 2018. He's already said, well, if it doesn't happen, you know, if I'm not reelected, it's not going to happen. So even if there's not a shovel in the ground and it never happens, he's going to say, well, but it'll never happen unless I'm reelected. And of course, every candidate that's challenging him is going to have to say, well, I don't know what I'd be able to do if this thing is already in motion. Um, I've seen two different polls on the issue. When the poll includes the cost to taxpayers, it doesn't do very well. When it includes the job numbers, it does better. 
and it depends on how you lead the conversation. Yeah. If you say, I mean, the governor's like, we're going to create 13,000 jobs and get a $10 billion investment. It's going to be awesome. You know, even though the head of the company is only saying 3,000. Even though Donald Trump only said 3,000. Yeah. Um, you know, the other thing I'll say is, in terms of transforming our economy, you know, we, when they make analogies to Silicon Valley in California, that's where the R&D happens. They had the smartest immigrants from around the world move to the coast of California to rise and create this talent pool. You know, we're doing the assembly and the manufacturing of it. $20 an hour is not going to bring the greatest people from around the world. It might bring some. You know, I also heard an analogy of the oil boom in North Dakota and that everybody's going to move here. Well, the average pay in 2012 was 112 grand for unskilled labor to come to North Dakota. They're not paying 112 grand to come to Racine. So, I mean, there's market forces that you just can't, I mean, again, if this happens in any capacity, you know, we still might be debating whether this was a good idea or a bad idea 10 years from now. Yeah. Whether so, it passes or not. Whether yeah. it passes or not, yeah. 20 years from now. Yep. This might be a stupid question, but can you add an amendment that puts in a little bit more what we can expect or what we need to expect out of the outcome? I think Senator Fitzgerald sort of said he would like to see, yeah. you know, what are the assurances of, of when. I mean, we have a timetable and... In the Senate, at least. Yeah, we have a timetable in the analysis of... But, you know, I mean, I mean, the Weedick was saying it'll be six years till we have 13,000. The governor said in a tweet, 13,000 by 2020. Um, you know, and that's sort of where the political is entering the... And, you know, we don't know. Um, in the assembly, we did try some amendments, like guaranteeing a certain number of jobs, yeah. that kind of thing. None of those passed in terms of trying to guarantee small cars. Yeah. Now, again, the incentives that are paid are based on performance, right? So jobs are created that then trigger a payment of incentives. The real question is about the balance, the net revenue on those things. Do, do the jobs generate more revenue than what we're paying them to create them? and the longevity, right, do they stay? And then if they don't stay, can we get that money back or not? And that's been a real struggle. The clawback nature of incentives, you gave an example earlier of, of a different location where that's been the case. That is a huge, not just in this case, but in economic development circles, the idea of a clawback and how to do that effectively, nobody has that nailed down. Because the other side tends to have more attorneys on <laughs> how to, you know, impact what qualifies as a job or not. Right. One of the questions I asked at the hearing the other day was, Let's say we build this facility and they ex exhaust the capital credits, the $1.35 billion uh, through 2026, but the LCD screens have declined and the market's changed. Is there anything that prohibits them from coming back to us to ask for more incentives? You know, and the answer is no. And of course, we would be in a bit of a bind because we'd already invested so much and we don't want to lose it, but it makes us more dependent on you know, them coming back. And the one thing that we know about Foxconn is they are ruthless in their negotiations around the country to extract as much as they can. In the MOU, it documents that Governor Walker and the administration made three offers. The first two were rejected, and I don't know what they offered, you know, and so they probably kept, you know, upping it, um, you know, to a level that some other states weren't willing to go to. I know uh, John Kasich in Ohio said, you know, we're still interested in getting some of the other Foxconn businesses, but we're not going to buy them. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, again, I hope from a policy grounds for the best case scenario, but, you know, because the governor's got a little bit of a, a, a blind spot on the job creation numbers, I feel like it was, you know what, let's, let's roll the dice. The, the what I called headline numbers on this got a lot of attention when it came out. The 10 billion investment, the 22,000 indirect jobs, the 20 million square foot facility, right? 11 Lambeau fields. A lot of that got the attention. And once you got past the headlines, there wasn't a lot of detail there. And I think um, no matter how quickly we move this, whether it's voted on next week or a month from now or a year from now, I don't know that there's answers possible to a lot of these questions. A lot of this is just uncertainty that's inherent in trying to do economic development or any kind of public policy making. You don't know what's gonna come in the future. The Legislative Fiscal Bureau doesn't know, the governor doesn't know, uh, the minority leader doesn't know, nobody knows. 
And so we're left having to take a risk and trust that what we were told will happen. Um, I think, Amanda, your point about staying in touch with your legislators is key at this point, is no matter how you feel about this deal, if you have outstanding concerns, they are the ones who you have charged to represent you in these negotiations. That is their job. Your job as a voter is to hold them accountable. And so you being here tonight is the best thing you could be doing at this very time to do your job, but you've got to hold them accountable for doing their job, and the way you do that is by asking them questions. Um, you know, the fact that they weren't here tonight. Ask them why not. Ask them why they weren't here. Uh, I happen to know there was a Senate Republican golf outing fundraiser in Madison today. Um, I don't know that that's the reason why none of them are here, but I know that happened. Um, and so, you know, why weren't they here? Why didn't they want to come and make this case? Here's a chance to connect with voters. They wouldn't do it. Um, I've had no problems booking people on my show to talk about this. It's a different scenario, right? They're not facing you directly. It's a lot easier to talk to a microphone or to answer a call over a phone than it is to talk directly to people. Um, I, I attended a town hall meeting that Senator Roth had in Shattuck Park a couple weeks ago. I don't know if any of you were at that town hall meeting. This was right after the announcement had happened. He took tons of questions. It was mostly about transportation and the budget because uh, that was the pressing story at that time. Um, but he, he was happily facing voters. He was answering questions. I thought he did a great job of it. I know he'll do that again on my show on Monday. Again, he's, he starts about 10, 20. Uh, on Monday. So tune in if you're interested in hearing what he has to say. Um, but you are the people whose money they're talking about, right? The $3 billion, that's your money, at least some of it. And so I think that's where sort of, I mean, we got five minutes left. If there's more people want to talk about, um, I'll get off my soapbox here. But I think that's the role to your question earlier. The role you can play right now is letting your legislator know how you feel about this. And even if that's just to ask questions, you don't have to know the answers. You don't have to have all the answers. You can ask the questions. Their job is to bring you the answers. And if they can't do that, the next question is why, right? And, and pursuing that is, I think, as a voter, I would call it your responsibility, but uh, it's at least a fun way to spend some time if you're a nerd like, 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 like some of us. Um, other questions or thoughts or concerns to wrap this up? Yeah. Uh, Gordon is a member of the Budget Committee. I'm going to send that one over to you. So this is where you get the same thing at the federal level. You get into a little complication between debt and deficit. Right. Well, when the governor was making the case, I think when he first got in, it was that we have a shortfall and we need to cut government costs, and that was definitely deficit. Um, one of the issues with transportation and the reason that we have such a problem is because the revenues don't pay for it, we have borrowed and borrowed and borrowed over the last six years that 23 cents of every dollar that we bring in is paying off debt. And that's really unsustainable and now the debt is so high that they don't want to issue more debt and so we're delaying projects. Um, this is more operating. When we say $3 billion outside of the 250 million of additional transportation borrowing, which even though it's 250 million paid out over 20 years, is not pocket change compared to what we're talking about on the three billion dollars of operating expenses. Because you know we do a two-year budget, we spend 38 billion dollars um, between 2023 and 2026. Two percent of all state revenues would go to Foxconn under the uh, best-case scenario here. Um, it could be higher than that. So as to your, I mean, you know, I'll tell you this, uh, we're spending more money in this budget that we're gonna pass eventually uh, than the revenue we're bringing in, you know, which it, during a good economy, you know, we're starting with a bigger balance. That's what allows us to do it. But if the economy slows down, that's gonna be problematic. And in the next budget, it's gonna, you know, we can increase school funding for two years and then two years from now we can be cutting it again because we don't have money. Oh, and by the way, I told you, we're gonna age 
we're going to have less revenue, we're going to have more expenses, and we're going to have a tougher time dividing the pie among schools, prisons, Foxconn, you know, all these things. And so, you know, it is part, I mean, a lot of people aren't going to be around when eight years from now, you know, to have that moment of accountability, or 15 years from now, or 30 years from now. And so that's, but we also have to take into account what the impact is. You know, I worry about what it's like in 2026, my daughter who's here. So, Gordon, you said that in the 1719 biennial budget that you're debating right now, that is almost two months overdue, that there is more spent than revenue brought in. That's correct. Doesn't the state constitution require a balanced budget? Yes. So how they, is that possible? Yeah, so um, the 1517 budget, which technically ended on June, June 30th, 30th uh, we had one-time Medicaid savings, partially because the economy got better, right. partially because we got, I don't know, some federal thing that allowed us to have a bigger balance. And so when you started with the bigger balance, you are able to smooth it out, it. but it doesn't. It sets you up for a problem in the There's next. There's some one-time carryover, basically. Correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So, closing thoughts on this. When I talked with Professor David Gerard earlier this week on my show, he, I asked him, "Is this a good deal or a bad deal? Can you tell us?" And he said, "The way to answer that question, if this is a good or a bad deal, is with a question, and that is, what is your goal? It's a good deal or it's a bad deal based on what you want the outcome to be. What is it you are trying to accomplish?" So I'm not going to ask you if it's a good deal or a bad deal. I think we've made pretty clear where you guys stand on that. As a deal goes, my question is, what should the goal be? What, what should the outcome be of either this project, this package, or our state's economic development efforts writ large? What do you think the outcome or goal should be? I think ideally we have long-term, sustainable, good-paying jobs that will be around here and that take care of their employees and that take care of the community that they're in. I mean, in the long term, for this specific project, I would say, you know, how will you measure what success is? I told you the guy from Milwaukee, the Tim Sheehy, said if half of this happens, it right. would be fantastic. <laughs> so I don't know if that lowers some people's bars, but, you know, so I don't know how I'll, you know, I'll, I will measure success if we don't get taken to the cleaners entirely. Um, and like I said, I hope it works out and that we can enhance it, improve it, but I have my doubts based on the reputation. Long term, I'm an opportunity guy, meaning, I want people to be able to uh, live here, uh, raise their kids, have them be educated, and if they leave, hopefully they'll come back. Um, you know, but that it's always a place with a high quality of life where you can, you know, live uh, and do pretty well. Um, you know, when I think about what's happening in a lot of parts of the state and a lot of parts of the country, uh, you know, the minute we didn't do broadband for everybody, just like electricity as a public utility was probably the end of a lot of these communities. I, you know, I, I have a hard time imagining all of us that live in the Fox Valley have some access to high-speed internet in work and at home, uh, and so many communities don't. Yeah. And when we say, gosh, you know, what's happening to rural America? Well, how can you remotely compete? I mean, businesses don't have to be located anywhere. They could be located anywhere. Um, so to me, you know, if you want to talk about